My name is Bobby Ridge. I am the Secretary and Treasurer of the United States Transhumanist Party and I have a bachelor's degree in biomedical science at California State University of Sacramento. My name is Gennady Stolyarov II. I am the Chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party. Today we are going to provide you with an overview of transhumanist ideas, concepts, emerging technologies, key figures within the transhumanist movement, as well as researchers whose work is going to bring about the transhuman era. Yeah, and so we wanted to provide a broad and easy explanation of what transhumanism is and give people an area to start their research. And so this is excellent for beginners, but it, I think uh, a lot of uh, scholars should be, um, be provided with a lot of valuable resources in this video. Our first topic will be, what is transhumanism? Transhumanism is the philosophy and movement which holds that through science, technology, and reason, we can push back and remove the obstacles that have plagued the human condition. Examples of these obstacles include involuntary death, diseases, poverty, scarcity of basic needs, war, pollution, tribalism, cognitive biases, and mob behaviors. Throughout human history, our species has unfortunately been plagued by these perils, and while the progress of science and technology has alleviated many of them, for instance, our life expectancies are much greater than those of our hunter-gatherer ancestors had been. Nonetheless, these problems are still with us, and transhumanism holds that during the next stage of technological advancement, finally, these problems can be overcome. And there are several ways of understanding the term transhumanism. All of these ways are compatible with one another and complementary. If you consider the Latin roots of the term transhumanism, it means beyond human. So that refers to overcoming the deleterious limitations of the human condition that exists today. Another way of looking at transhumanism is that we seek to create essentially humanity plus, that the enhanced humans who will emerge will still be humans. They will still maintain all of the good attributes of humanity that we value, but they will only keep the good parts and the beneficial potentialities. They will not have the harmful aspects, the frailties of the human body, as well as the flaws of today's human psychology. Yes. Furthermore, transhumanism can be seen as going beyond but also being a logical extension of Enlightenment humanism. The thinkers of the 18th century Age of Enlightenment held that through reason and the systematic application of rationality, we can improve the human condition. Right now, we have better tools than the 18th century thinkers had, and on the horizon are even better tools to yeah. come. And so we'll be discussing these tools. Um, so, so the argument essentially is that of what transhumanism is, is that there are uh, about 10 sciences, uh, very powerful sciences, and of course more that we're not gonna discuss, but here we're gonna discuss about 10 sciences that are extremely powerful and will be capable of helping us live to 120, 150, and thousands and millions of years, as crazy as it sounds. So we'll be discussing that, but we're also discussing the billionaires and whole governments. Um, collectively, if you add it all up, they've been adding, they've been investing trillions of dollars into this in the past like about 10 years. But what's really important is that this should happen in the next 10 to 30 years. Um, you know, living thousands and millions of years um, should be achieved in the next 10 to 30 years. And one of the concepts for understanding this is the idea of longevity escape velocity. And the person who has been the primary popularizer of this concept, who has articulated it for about a decade and a half now, is Aubrey de Grey. So Aubrey de Grey, in 2003, uh, co-founded 
the Methuselah Foundation, which supported advanced research and radical life extension. Aubrey de Grey has since created his own foundation, the SENS Research Foundation, in 2009. The Methuselah Foundation is still operating as well. Aubrey de Grey is renowned for coining the term Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence, or SENS. Essentially, SENS is an engineering approach to addressing seven principal types of molecular and cellular damage caused by metabolism, which essentially occurs in everybody as a result of being alive. And these are seven principal types of damage which, while we cannot prevent them from happening with today's technology, we can potentially reverse them when they do happen, when yeah. they do accumulate, and bring ourselves back to a more youthful state. Yeah, and he's really well known for saying the first thousand-year-old has already been born. And what did he say about the 20 years? Yes, so uh, his statement now is that within approximately 20 years, we have about a 50% probability of reaching this state called longevity escape velocity with adequate funding. And he qualifies it uh, with the reference to adequate funding. However, the concept of longevity escape velocity is in order for somebody to live for thousands or millions of years, we don't have to know how to achieve that as a direct goal right away. We just have to know how to extend somebody's lifespan by 20 or 30 years. And in 20 or 30 years, we are going to have another generation of medical advancements. So the people who would have died without this first line of life extending treatments would be alive for the next 20 or 30 years to benefit from the next generation of treatments. And if they can benefit from the next generation of treatments, uh, then they'll be around to benefit from the subsequent generation of treatments, yeah. and so on. That, that's the longevity escape velocity, right? Yes. And so, yeah, so essentially, uh, science will be, will extend your lifespan more than a year, um, within a year, um, is like a simple way of understanding it. And um, here's the graph that he provided, um, showing, kind of giving a simple explanation of what longevity escape velocity is. So he, he's, he came up with one of the best definitions of aging, which is, uh, so he says there's seven broad areas that our body accumulates damage. And here are his seven rejuvenation techniques that he has um, to maintain our body. And uh, in, in the future, eventually cure, but it, it's, it's particularly important to maintain our body. It's similar to where the way you maintain like a, a car or a house. Um, you know, there's really old houses or really old cars, but they look perfectly new because we maintain them and they work perfectly fine. And you can actually augment those cars, but... Um, and so with this slide, he says, geriatrics is the attempt to stop damaging from causing pathology. Traditional gerontology is the attempt to stop metabolism from causing damage. And, but Aubrey Gray's SENS engineering approach is to eliminate the damage periodically. So keeping its abundance below the level that causes the pathology. And this approach, this maintenance approach is quintessential um, because to give you an understanding, if we cured all of cancer right now, it would only increase our average lifespan by three years. And so it, we, we do need to cure cancer, but it's important, this maintenance approach is very important to increasing our lifespan. Absolutely, so the idea would be in a hypothetical near-term future, people could go in every 10 or 20 years or whatever interval of time uh, over which sufficient damage accumulates and they would have a rejuvenation therapy where at the cellular level, these types of damage are repaired and they become biologically reset to a more youthful state. So if they're 50 at the time this is done, they might become biologically 30 again and they could live for 20 more years until they become biologically 50. Yeah. And then when they go in for their next rejuvenation treatment, 20 years of advancement would have taken place, and that treatment could be more comprehensive, more reliable. It might clear out certain types of damage 
that would have been intractable uh, in regard to the older treatment that they received previously. So each iteration of treatments might become more effective, more capable of rendering someone uh, even more youthful than they were before. Yes. Uh, and so here's some popular, uh, here's a popular documentary that he's in called The Immortalist. And here's some of his books. Here's a place to donate money and help out with this movement. And he's actually have, has already had a lot of funding uh, from people like Michael Greaves, Peter Thiel, Paul Glenn. Um, he's had millions of dollars um, of funding already, and he was actually inherited with sixteen and a half million dollars from his mother, in which he's placed large amounts of that into his Sense Research Foundation, so that we can all achieve the longevity escape velocity. Yes. Now he is remarkable in that he has essentially made it his life's mission to reverse the damage of aging to allow individuals to essentially choose to become more youthful and choose how long they're going to live. And he has devoted a lot of his personal funds to that. He does have a few wealthy donors, as you mentioned, Bobby. He has said he needs about an order of magnitude more funds yeah. in order to uh, reach longevity escape velocity within that 20 year time frame and he has stated essentially with 10 times more funding uh, he could progress at uh, approximately three times the pace uh, of the advancement that is currently occurring he has stated unfortunately over the past 10 <coughs> years or so about three years of advancement had taken place and this was because funding was still scarce he is hopeful though that because of the effects of discoveries in other fields that have occurred in the meantime, that rate of advancement may be accelerated. So. Yeah, which we'll discuss about. So this is Bill Andrews. He's one of the leading scientists in genetics, specifically in the uh, extending of telomeres. And he led a team to discover the first human telomerase. And he's getting very close to extending our telomeres so that we can take steps closer to living indefinitely. Yes, Bill Andrews is the founder and CEO of Sierra Sciences. It was founded in 1999 in the Reno, Nevada area. Actually, he is located quite close to where I am. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He's an ultra marathoner and yeah, we have awesome. run together. So. Uh, he is very much somebody who takes good care of his personal health and essentially has a commitment to achieving longevity yeah. for the human species. So he has written two books called Curing Aging and Telomere Lengthening. Uh, he has also been featured in the documentary The Immortalists, and I would recommend all three of those. Uh, one of the aspects of his books, which I think are great for beginners uh, within the transhumanist movement, people who are just being introduced to life extension, is uh, he writes in a very accessible style. He uses a lot of metaphors that people who uh, are new to the field would readily understand. And I would encourage you also to look up his video presentations online. He yeah. has given many of them. There's plenty of YouTube videos where you can learn about it. And you can check out Bill and his, uh, Bill Andrews and his books to learn about it. But uh, for a simple explanation, so the older you get, the shorter your telomeres get on your DNA. Mm -hmm. And once they get really short, and, and especially when they're completely gone, you die. Yes. And so we need to extend those. And Bill Andrews is actually, he created already a gene therapy to extend those. And um, right now they're in clinical trials. And so we may see uh, aspects of aging or all of aging cured very soon. They're uh, seeking patients for the clinical trials for labella gene therapeutics, as I understand it. Now, the telomeres uh, are essentially the end caps of one's chromosomes and they shorten with each replication and as they shorten essentially there is increased frailty increased damage 
due to aging. And uh, as you mentioned, Bobby, once they essentially shorten past a, a certain critical length, then the individual dies. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's 5,000 base pairs. So Craig Venter uh, is an incredible human being. He has a PhD in physiology and pharmacology and is the co-founder, executive, and head of scientific strategy of Human Longevity Incorporation, along with so much more. He's well known for competing against the U.S. government to sequence the first human genome. And where the U.S. government spent over $2 billion, he spent only $100 million, and he won that race. And so their Human Longevity Incorporation's goal, which you can read on their website, is to build the world's most comprehensive database of human genotypes and phenotypes and then subject it to machine learning so that it can help develop new ways to fight diseases associated with aging. So artificial intelligence is about to interface with massive amounts of data of uh, genomics, which, which is uh, going to increase the likelihood of us living to 120. He's doing so much more with synthetic life and advanced scanning machines and much more, which are all like really incredible things that you should research. But his, his Human Longevity Corporation is, is particularly important because hospitals are likely to adopt what they are doing. 100% of the healthy people that go to their uh, corporation have, are considered healthy by modern medicine. And, but they find something pathologically concerning in about 40% of them. And so they have a 100% diagnosing rate and have, their findings have been 100% successfully treated. And so this offers a lot of patients the ability to detect potentially serious medical conditions early on. It allows people to more effectively treat those medical conditions before they become debilitating, yeah. uh, before they become lethal. So this is another set of tools in the arsenal of medicine that will be forthcoming and definitely a very interesting area to watch and uh, for those people who are interested in their own health, something to look into. Yes, and they've reduced sequencing costs from, in 2001, it was, with the government, it was $2 billion, almost $3 billion, um, if you add up how much money he spent and the government. And with the utilization of $50 million computer, that's the first human genome was sequenced, 2001. And, and now it's less than $1,000 in 2017, and with $100 in computing power. So the price reduced dramatically, and estimates are that it's going to be almost free by 2022. So this is an exponential decline in the cost of human genome sequencing that outpaces the exponential decline in the cost of uh, computer processing power <laughs> uh, for Moore's, Moore's law. law, yes. And so uh, they've already sequenced over 41,000 genomes, but they're about to do a million a year soon. And they're about to interface artificial intelligence to that, which you know, is mind boggling. And so it's highly personalized instead of generalized, like what medicine is, highly predictive, um, not costly, not as costly as modern medicine, and so much more. So this is Liz Parrish. She founded the biotech company called BioViva in 2015, where they develop therapies to treat severe genetic disorders in cellular aging. They are showing uh, great results, such as reversal in mice, and uh, she's well known for doing self-experimentation because of how cost-worthy and slow the FDA process is right now. And she's teamed up with Aubrey Gray and Bill Andrews and um, is a key player with uh, increasing her longevity. Uh, I wish I had more time to discuss about George Church. He, uh, he's done so much, but so, he's a professor at Harvard and MIT, and he, his work was very influential in sequencing the first human genome. Uh, he's well known for extracting woolly mammoth genes um, using uh, genetic technology such as CRISPR. And uh, uh, he, he placed those woolly mammoth genes in Asian elephants. And we will elaborate about CRISPR a little bit later. Uh, he's also working on xenotransplantation, which we will also elaborate on. And uh, he's also working on synthetic biology, uh, the brain initiative, and, and much more. 
And so here's a quote in 2017. He said, we are about to end the aging process in the next five years, no less. But then soon after, followed up with saying, within five years, it seems plausible to have some gene therapies and FDA-approved clinical trials in dogs aimed at general age reversal, but quite likely labeled for specific diseases and in humans soon thereafter. And I would add one critical aspect to that prediction, which will determine whether or not it materializes, would be the speed of FDA approval for the clinical trials and the treatments that may result from them. Yeah. As we know, unfortunately, the FDA in the U.S. can be quite slow. It can take 10 to 15 years to get a particular new drug or new therapy approved. There are some ways to accelerate the review process in certain areas, and I hope he's able to take advantage of them, but yeah. this is also one area in which political activism is important, speeding up the time frames for the review and approval of potential breakthrough treatments. Yeah. So this is David Sinclair. He's a key player in um, age reversal technology or life extension technology. You, you can call it life extension research or anti-aging research. These, we'll use these interchangeably. It's important to note that you're not going to be living hundreds or thousands of years in a decrepit state you'll be living in a very healthy state you know, at the age of like 25 and possibly even healthier than that because we'll be able to augment ourselves. And so he has global labs all around the world and he's showing incredible results um, in mice such as extending their lifespan. And so he's, he's really focused on creating a pill that we can just take to live to like 120 or 150. He's done so much more than that. He's getting really close to having the FDA approve aging as a uh, definition of, of disease, which would accelerate research so much quicker. And one area that is related to this is the TAME trial, uh, which uh, was initiated by Dr. Nir Barzilai for metformin, uh, which is a common diabetes drug uh, being used essentially as an anti-aging pill uh, because it has shown some favorable effects on longevity where diabetic patients who took metformin later in life uh, on average tended to live longer than non-diabetic patients who didn't take metformin. Yeah. So this was the uh, motivation for the TAME trial and the TAME trial is important because it is the first trial that specifically looks at uh, effects of a medicine on aging reversal and it is the first FDA approved trial to do that and what David Sinclair is doing seems to be aimed at a similar goal to get aging classified as a disease or a negative condition against which you can develop treatments, therapies, drugs and then they can be tested, you can have clinical trials, if the trials show success, then the FDA can approve those treatments specifically as anti-aging treatments and not just to treat, say, heart disease or yeah. Alzheimer's disease or diabetes. Yeah. And so we actually talked about metformin in the next slide. So generally just pretty much covered everything. But they, they discovered metformin by looking at diabetic patients because that's, that's the drug they use to treat diabetes. And they saw that people who take this and have diabetes, they tend to live longer than people who are healthy. And so David Sinclair is working on that. He's also working with NMN, uh, which is showing very promising results. The metformin and, and NMN are both in clinical trials right now. And so we, we may see aging reversed very soon. And so just do more research on these drugs and obviously don't start taking them until clinical trials are done and and you talk to your doctor. Yes, and it's important to recognize that these clinical trials are designed still to test for very specific yeah. indicators and they try to recruit patients who have certain conditions or uh, patients uh, of certain age groups yeah. and 
if a drug is shown to be successful in a certain group of patients, that doesn't mean everybody out there uh, should start buying it yeah. tomorrow and taking it. Uh, it means that something else has been understood about how the aging process could be reversed, yeah. but ultimately we're still going to need scientists and medical professionals to interpret that and translate it yeah. into actionable steps that the general population can take. Yeah. And so this is a CRISPR-Cas9 system. It was published in, only in 2012. If you've uh, not heard of it, you've probably been living under a rock because it's uh, been anything that scientists have been talking about in the last like five years. It's, uh, it only took five years for FDA approval to occur, which is super fast for uh, gene therapy. And human clinical trials lately have been accelerating in areas like China and even in the US. And so we've already had gene technologies like this, which, such as ZFN and Talens and zinc finger nuclease, but CRISPR is 100 times easier to use and like 10 times more efficient, and it's getting more efficient. And so uh, quite simply, an explanation is, it's a gene technology where you can take out some, a piece of DNA, a very specific piece of DNA, and put in new DNA. And so very soon, we're gonna see all genetic diseases wiped out because we can take them out and put in you know, a healthy one. Yes, as, as long as it's known which genes essentially cause yeah. the disease, then they could be edited out and replaced. Yeah, with which we've sequenced the human genome, we're synthetic biology, we're getting pretty close, which th there is a lot not known about uh, our genes, but we're getting very close. This is xenotransplantation. George Church, Martin Rothblatt, Craig Mentor, and uh, I just heard about this startup that got like over $30 million to uh, work on it. This is where you genetically modify like a pig, uh, such as with that gene technology, CRISPR, and you make their genes more human-like so that their organs are more human-like. And so we already use pigs for a lot of uh, transplant, transplant um, organs, like their trachea or their skin, but their organs, their heart and their lungs and liver are going to be extremely assimilating once we genetically modify them. And so we're about to have an endless amount of organs. The organ transplant list is about to be annihilated, and which is incredible because an estimate is that about 40% of deaths could have been prevented if they had an organ transplant. And so we're about to save 40% of people, which is incredible. And if you if you feel kind of weird about getting a pig's organ, well, we're about to 3D print organs very soon. That is becoming a reality. And we're also 3D printing a lot of food. This is the, the cheeseburger. Um, the first burger that was that was 3D printed, but it was a super expensive. But th lately they've been 3D printing lots of candy and pizza and plenty of other foods, very uh, cheap. And so you, know, you can imagine everyone having a 3D printer soon that's a lot more advanced than what it is right now. And it'd be like Star Trek, essentially. You, know, you just plug in what you want, what food, what, what toy, you know, what parts of a car, and you 3D print it. And so this is heterokaryonic parabiosis. It's a really interesting um, life extension re uh, technology that you can use right now uh, and just do research with. Now, one thing about parabiosis, uh, which is interesting, is it, it has been in use for quite some time. And uh, this is essentially where the circulatory system of an older organism is connected to a younger organism. The older organism benefits, the younger organism might suffer a deterioration because essentially it's the two systems supporting one another. So the older organism gets the benefit of the younger system. The younger organism has to support the older organism, so uh, that might be deleterious to it. There have been attempts by some to uh, conduct parabiosis on humans, like injecting uh, the blood of younger humans into yeah. older Peter humans. Peter really known for doing it. He right. publicly announced that he's doing it. Right. However, uh, there hasn't, to my knowledge, been definitive scientific evidence that this is a successful approach because if you just take the blood of a younger organism, you're not getting the benefits of the circulatory system and other systems of that younger organism especially if the blood has the same or similar content, uh, whether you're younger or older. Uh, and this is where I think more research 
is needed, to what extent yeah. is it the connection between the two organisms versus the actual blood. Uh, I happen to think that uh, this is probably too simple uh, in terms of what is going to work to repair the damage of aging. That is, if it were as easy as just taking the blood of a younger creature, then this probably would have been a viable approach that generated tremendous longevity gains yeah. a long time ago. Yeah, it's just an interesting area of research. And mm -hmm. uh, in the picture, you can see that the research has declined a lot. And so here's caloric restriction. It's a really interesting area uh, of uh, extending your longevity that is seems to be somewhat promising. So here's Sergio Canavero. He said that he's doing the first live human head transplant in 2018, and he thinks it has a 90% successful rate. But it's very controversial among scientists and I mean, just the public in general uh, with, with whether his research in the past 30 years has been uh, substantiated at all. He has done some transplants, but none where the organism actually lived after the transplant. And he, he has made some promises about making uh, human head transplants, but uh, he sometimes uh, does not have a record of carrying through on yeah. those promises. Here's Larry Ellison, has a net worth of six, oh, about 60 billion, and, uh, and since 1997 has donated more than $370 million to life extension research. Uh, here's a quote where he said, death never made sense to me. So this is Martine Rothblatt. She is one of the most incredible human beings that um, have ever existed. She founded Sirius XM with Howard Stern, and then soon thereafter her daughter uh, began to die of a rare lung disease, in which she knew very little about biology, so she taught herself enough biology um, and medicine to find a cure for her daughter and save her daughter's life, and then start manufacturing that cure at United Therapeutics, where they, they save a lot of those people's lives who have that disease, and they are working on life extension technologies, such as xenotransplantation. Uh, she's also investing in making robots conscious, and working on uploading our consciousness to computers, and uh, she made significant contributions to the first electric helicopter. And so here's the first electric helicopter, and here's the robot, Bina 48. And here's some of her books that you should read. Peter Thiel, uh, another very wealthy person, donating millions of dollars to curing aging and investing a lot in artificial intelligence. Like I said before, he's uh, currently taking um, doing parabiosis. Um, and here's Osman Kaibar, has a very successful longevity uh, research company. And here's Peter Nygaard. He's uh, another very, very wealthy person. Uh, he's very popular for uh, the fashion industry, uh, for Nygaard International. But more importantly, he founded Nygaard Biotech in the Bahamas in 2013, where he is uh, trying to cure aging with stem cells. And it's notable he was able to influence the legislature of yeah. the Bahamas to enact laws that are favorable to the kind of experimentation that he wants to engage in. It's not clear to what extent that, it, that would help other entrepreneurs who might be interested in locating there and also pursuing biomedical research, but that is a potential area to look into. To what extent uh, would Peter Nygaard's lobbying activities to uh, liberalize this field on his behalf have spillover benefits for other enterprises who are seeking to do something similar? Yeah, and uh, so he's been taking stem cell therapies four times a year for the past like decade. He claims to have cured aging, but uh, uh, we're not entirely sure about that. Yes, we're not certain if the change in his appearance is simply the result of an older person choosing to become more fit, yeah. uh, or whether he's biologically younger now than he was prior to 2009. Yeah. But, but it is like somewhat convincing because uh, if you've been keeping up with stem cell therapy lately, it's, it has been making just incredible advancements and in just like curing and treating diseases like left and right like uh, severe spinal injuries and MS and, and autism and rejuvenating hearts. 
there's, there's a popular story of Mel Gibson. Um, his father is like uh, probably a week away, a week away from his death, and uh, he comes out of Panama, a clinic in Panama, where he got uh, IV injections of stem cells, and he felt like just as good as new. And so, here's some videos showing how uh, powerful stem cells are. Here's some quadriplegics uh, from a stroke, and they were injected with stem cells, and uh, their movement came back to them. Yes, so feel free to look up these videos on YouTube. One of them is titled, Breakthrough Stem Cell Treatment Gives Stroke Victims Stunning Recovery. Another one is titled, Special Stem Cell Treatment for Spinal Cord Injuries Shows Promise. And these are mainstream news reports about the successes of these treatments for patients in the very recent past. And then there's another article, Brain Stem Cells Slow Aging in Mice, with regard to how stem cells were injected into the hypothalamus of mice and increased their lifespans by 10%. So by comparison, if humans received a comparable uh, proportion of added lifespan, that would be an increase of another eight years. Of course, mouse biology is different from human biology, so the same treatments may not achieve the same proportional life extension, but nonetheless, uh, it is promising, and stem cells are definitely an area where continued research and advancement are occurring quite rapidly. Yep. So here's Google, you know, another company that has large amounts of money. They founded Calico in 2013, and their goal is to devise interventions to live longer lifespans and healthier lives. And uh, they so far invested over a billion dollars. Mark Zuckerberg, he uh, has pledged in 2016 three billion dollars over the next ten years to cure all diseases. Here's a, pr a three million dollar prize towards anti-aging research. Yes, this is kind of the equivalent of the Nobel Prize, except for biomedical scientists to yeah. encourage continued research. And it's intended to reward people whose life's work has been in this field and who have achieved major breakthroughs in medical science, biology, biotechnology, yeah. and related fields. And so here's Peter Diamandis. He's well known for the Ansari X Prize. Uh, he makes large investments um, and contributions to uh, life extension technologies and AI research. He's very public about wanting to live for thousands of years and trying to help everybody else live that long. And he's excellent at teaching this, uh, transhumanism. Uh, so check him out on YouTube. He's like totally awesome. He uh, wrote this book where he thoroughly, thoroughly describes how the future is going to have a, a massive amount of resources for everyone due to exponential technologies demonetizing, dematerializing, and democratizing. Yes, and this is actually where the political approach of the U.S. Transhumanist Party differs from every other political party in existence, because every other political party and all political movements historically have been rooted in scarcity. And scarcity is the source of a lot of conflict because much of the conflict is over resources, uh, even a lot of ideologies that seek to pit people against one another and paint some group of people as the other, the outsider, the evil group. This is either subtly or not so subtly motivated by the desire to take their stuff. So what if we had universal material abundance where all of the basic needs of life were easy and cheap to fulfill yeah. and people really could focus on actualizing themselves, uh, developing their potential, being the people they want to be. Yeah. That politics of scarcity would be completely obsolete and counterproductive. So yeah. we need to develop different political and societal norms for living in the age of abundance. Yeah, and, and he takes it a little bit step forward because he talks about not just um, giving everybody their basic needs, but giving everyone a plethora of needs. You know, possibly the poorest people can have mansions and mm -hmm. like Ferraris. And it sounds impossible, but 
but due to information talk, everything becoming information te technology, we will see this exponential increase of demonetization, dematerializing, and demonetizing, uh, similar to the way our phone did, right? And which we'll talk about a little more, but this is literally like a trillion dollars in our pocket. And we didn't notice that um, that happened, really. Yes. We have access to a lot of goods for free now, which would have been quite costly in the past. Literature, music, art of a variety of genres. You could still buy a hard copy book. You could still go pay to listen to a symphony orchestra, but you could also find a treatise by Aristotle completely for free online. You could listen to a Beethoven symphony completely for free online. You could find a digital painting that somebody created and look at it or download it completely for free online. That doesn't take away from any of the older technologies or modes of production, but it does open up a wide array of options for people to pursue and people without a lot of means now could enjoy high culture in a way that would have been impossible several generations ago. Yeah. Here are two more prizes uh, to cure aging. Bill Maris, another very wealthy person, he, here's a quote. If you ask me today, is it possible to live up to be 500? The answer is yes. Naveen Jain, another very wealthy person, investing in uh, life extension research specifically on our gut microbiome. Uh, and there has been uh, recent research that has shown life extension in mice by manipulating their, uh, the, mi the microbiome inside their stomach. And it's interesting too that Naveen Jain uh, founded Moon Express or Moon X with a goal of returning to the moon. Yeah. It has been since 1972 that no human has landed on the moon. And I think it's well past time for us to return to set up colonies on the moon yeah. to begin resource extraction because ultimately our technology is so much further advanced now than it was in the 1970s but what we need is the entrepreneurial vision of people like uh, Naveen Jain to bring us back there to broaden the scope of our ambitions. Yeah and he, he makes uh, claims like in the next 10 years that we can all go to the moon the same way we can go to like Japan right now uh, from the US. Uh, and which actually seems plausible based on what you see at like SpaceX and what NASA has been doing and any other uh, space industries. Here are a few recent startups with a large amount of funding aimed at curing aging. And there's actually been so many more that have been uh, popping up. This, these are just ones I found like a month and a half ago or something. And so if you die in the next 10 to 30 years and you don't reach this revolution that is going to happen, then you can get yourself crop preserved. What is crop preservation? You can either get your whole body crop preserved or just your head. And it's a little expensive, but you can have monthly payment plans which make it extremely cheap. So it's available to just about anyone. And the way it works is you vitrify your tissue and then you store your body in liquid nitrogen. So it's, it's a lot different than just freezing yourself because freezing yourself can, will damage your body lots more, a lot more. And so they aim at uh, storing your body until science and technology is advanced enough and then they will bring back your body mm -hmm. uh, back to life. Yes, and uh, I will point out essentially cryonics is seen by many in the life extension community as a kind of plan B. Plan A is not to die, to yeah. uh, survive until longevity escape velocity arrives, yeah. to uh, lead a healthy lifestyle uh, in order to give oneself as many years as possible, and then to benefit from the rejuvenation therapies. Unfortunately, some people will not make it uh, even with the best intentions, and this is a fallback option. Uh, I would say it is much better than any other option uh, for dealing with someone who has been legally declared dead because at least here there is some hope of being brought back. Yeah. Not with current technology, but with the technologies of the future. Right now, the most sophisticated organism that has been brought back after cryopreservation is the C. elegans roundworm. Nice. Uh, this, this was actually done by uh, Dr. Greg Fay uh, working with uh, Natasha Vita Moore. Sweet. And 
they have also been able, scientists that is, have also been able to essentially preserve particular organs like rabbit kidneys yeah. and then it essentially implant them into rabbits where the kidneys functioned at least for a while. Yeah. So that is the kind of level of advancement where we're at. It hasn't been uh, achieved yet that an entire mammal was cryopreserved and then brought back, but I think that would be the next stage to uh, get a small animal to the point where uh, they can be reliably brought back from, uh, say, a vitrification procedure. And if that can be demonstrated, then that would be evidence of hope for the humans who have been cryopreserved yeah. presently. Yeah. And so here's a few locations I found. I, I think there's two more in the U.S. I just couldn't quite find them. And they've been around for a long time. And globally, only a couple hundred people are using this technology. And only uh, like over a thousand people are on the waiting list. So in case they die. And so that definitely needs to... We need more people using this technology for a plethora of reasons. Most importantly, so your life is saved. But secondly, we need money being invested in this so it can become more advanced and so that it makes it more likely for it to work. Yes, certainly adoption by a greater fraction of the population would enable this technology to be scaled uh, so that there could be larger facilities so that the procedures could be standardized in such a manner that each individual procedure would be less expensive. Uh, I think all of the other options today uh, in terms of what happens during a funeral uh, are for me, for somebody who loves life and does not ever want to concede uh, the irreversibility of the end uh, to my existence, all those other options are just ghastly. So the question is how do we change cultural perceptions so that cryonics becomes the default option when people make plans, if, if they are ever legally dead, that this is the default plan. It's not some out there unusual thing that only a few people are doing. Yeah. Radfest is an event that is held annually now in San Diego, though they have other Radfest venues as well that have been opening up throughout the world. RAD stands for Revolution Against Aging and Death, and it is essentially a gathering of supporters, advocates, activists for indefinite life extension, dramatically longer lifespans, some of them would say immortality, and really it is meant to be ecumenical and inclusive. So there are scientists there, uh, there are activists, there are simply people who are interested in living longer, who are interested in healthy lifestyles, uh, and they have about a thousand people at each Rad Fest in San Diego, uh, and they are looking at other locations as well. So this is a way to connect with fellow supporters of longevity, of transhumanism, to speak to some of the scientists, yeah. to talk to journalists, to philosophers, uh, to AI researchers, uh, some of whom uh, have been at prior Radfests like Peter Voss or Ben Goetzel, yeah. uh, and more generally to build this movement. Yeah, yeah. from my understanding what Radfest is, it's pretty much like uh, cutting edge science to extending our lifespan mixed with like, uh, like a concert, like a music concert. Uh, that's kind of like my understanding of what it is. The, it looks like totally awesome. There are musical uh, aspects to it. Yeah. There were plays uh, that were shown. I moderated a panel on transhumanist politics where I gave a 13-minute presentation on the U.S. Transhumanist Party and how we are at the forefront of a peaceful revolution for human longevity. Please feel free to locate that presentation on YouTube and watch it as I think it's one of the best 
summaries of what the U.S. Transhumanist Party stands for. And subsequent to that, in the panel I moderated, Zoltan Istvan spoke. He was the first presidential candidate of the Transhumanist Party, the founder of the Transhumanist Party. He discussed his immortality bus tour and the effect it had on public perception of the transhumanist movement. Uh, we had Ben Goetzel speak about his work in artificial intelligence. We had Max Moore, who is also the CEO of the Alcor Power Preservation Foundation. He talked about common arguments that people will deploy against life extension and how to counter those arguments. And then Natasha Vita Moore uh, talked about her work as an artist and an educator and some of the advice that she had for people in the transhumanist movement. So it was quite a, an interesting and diverse panel and I'm certain in future rad fests uh, we're going to get uh, those calibers of speakers as well. Yeah. And so here's Ray Kurzweil and if you remember anything from this video definitely remember this human being because He's a complete genius and considered one of the world's greatest inventors and recently became Google's director of engineering focused on machine learning, which is uh, artificial intelligence. And he's done so much. Uh, he's invented so many things, but he's particularly popular for uh, making a, uh, a measurement, uh, an observation and providing empirical evidence, which he calls the law of accelerating returns. He has a 30 year track record due to this uh, law of accelerating returns with an 86% accuracy rate and it, it actually would have been higher but because of like social norms and people not adopting technologies that they could have they just didn't happen. Uh, some examples, he has 147 predictions but some examples are the collapse of the Soviet Union, when a computer would first beat the world's best grandmaster at chess, the rise of the internet and search engines, the, the wireless internet, text-to-speech converters for the blind and wearable computer technology, uh, when the entire human genome would be done. I mean, just incredible predictions. Here is his uh, law of accelerating returns um, applied to computer growth over the last 110 years. And it, this is how he's been making his predictions. The law of accelerating returns, when just applied to computational growth, showed that price performance and capacity of information technology grows at an exponential rate. It can be applied to more than just computers, though. Um, any information techno technologies, such as uh, the genome, or stem cells, or organ transplants. So some of his graphs, which are a bit out of date because uh, they appeared in his book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, which was published circa 2000, his graphs deal with the adoption of technologies as well. So the time frame in which a given technology spread from its inception to being adopted by a majority of the population has also continued to accelerate. It took several decades for the telephone and the radio to become widely used, whereas for the internet it only took a few years. Yeah. And likewise, uh, he notes that the paradigm of Moore's Law is not the first example of exponential improvement of yeah. computing People technology. People often get that confused with what he, he talks about. They get Moore's Law confused with laws of accelerating returns. Moore's Law is just one paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, he, he has shown four other paradigms to have occurred and uh, so you keep hearing people saying like Moore's Law is gonna it's slowing down, it's gonna stop. Well yeah that's what's gonna happen, that's what's happened for four other paradigms. But so a new paradigm is going to be adopted like uh, three-dimensional molecular circuits or quantum computers or there's many other things that can be adopted and this this acceleration is going to continue and the predictions he makes are are quite staggering about, about what's going to happen. A quick simple explanation of what a law of accelerating returns is is that the better you get at something the the faster you can become at getting better at it because you're using better technology to become better and so health and medicine is becoming an information technology um, because now we can reprogram the software of life, such as our genome, or growing organs, or stem cells. And so they're about to be uh, subjected to this exponential growth, which means this is going to 
uh, incredible advances are about to occur extremely quickly. And we're just on the knee of the curve, but in the next like 10 to 30 years, we're about to just see this flood of diseases cured because of this exponential increase. Yes, and what Ray Kurzweil's predictions focus on are our technical capabilities based on how technology has evolved and how technological growth has accelerated over time. One factor in this that will be critical would be society-wide acceptance of the new technologies as well as having political structures that do not unduly hinder them. These technologies can progress even in an imperfect environment, even if there are some restrictions because people are ingenious, they will find ways to work around them. If one jurisdiction yeah. cracks down on certain technologies, other jurisdictions might be more receptive. Yeah. But nonetheless, too much regimentation, uh, too many obstacles, too much hostility from the general public could derail these advancements. And this is the big unknown in all of this. This is why organizations like the US Transhumanist Party are striving to advocate for these emerging technologies because we do need the public to be accepting of them and to see this as a promising future yeah. the way it very well could be if these predictions materialize. Yeah, about the same time, uh, he has shown that this, uh, like for example with computational growth, that it, it was almost unstoppable. Because if you look at the graph, it's you don't see World War One or World War Two or the Cold War or the recession times, nothing f affecting it negatively like at all. And so it almost has like a mind of its own and it seems like it it just like cannot be hindered. And so when he makes these future predictions, it, it's really hard to see how how society can prevent his predictions. Because we've we've had times where they should have been prevented but they weren't. And it almost seems like only like a nuclear war or just some mass event of destruction can really prevent it and um, not really much else. I will say uh, two points in connection with that. First of all, this is one reason why the U.S. Transhumanist Party focuses on prevention of existential risk because there are certain phenomena that could endanger the entire human species. Nuclear war is one prominent example, and I would say that is the greatest existential risk today, yeah. given the geopolitical tensions. So that existential are risk is uh, the entire species either being destroyed or just like mostly destroyed, right? Yes, uh, set back sufficiently yeah. that much of our progress is lost. So in a nuclear winter, I'm not certain that the entire human species would be wiped out, but it would be thrown back into the Dark Ages. Yeah. Another existential risk would be an asteroid impact hitting the Earth and wiping out a lot of higher life forms. Uh, so efforts need to be directed toward asteroid detection and asteroid deflection. Yeah. I think actually commercial space exploration and attempts at asteroid mining would also have the side benefit of reducing that existential risk yeah. because if you can get to an asteroid, harness it for its resources, you would also then have the technology to redirect it uh, or to turn a potential threat into uh, something of benefit to humanity. Yeah. And uh, the last note I'll, I'll, t I'll say about it is that to, to give a practical example, uh, an understanding of the law of accelerating turns is in the 50s, uh, one of the first computers at MIT was uh, the size of half a building and was a terrible computer and it cost uh, $10 billion. And, and now our cell phone, a million times cheaper, a thousand times more powerful, and a lot smaller than half a building. That is about to occur to just about everything because everything is becoming information technology. I will add one more point on the law of accelerating returns. For those who are interested in contemplating it further, uh, I recommend a conversation in 2002 between Ray Kurzweil and Max Moore, of which you could find a transcript online. And essentially, they were discussing the question of how inevitable is this transformation 
Or on the other hand, how dependent is it going to be on societal factors yeah. and public acceptance and political obstacles or a receptive political <coughs> environment? And so here are some of uh, Ray's future predictions. He says by 2019, autonomous vehicles, so self-driving cars, will be common and reach general purpose. Well, GM just recently came out uh, this January uh, with a car that has no steering wheel. And they want to have a fleet of taxis with, with our self-driving by 2019. Uber wants to do pretty much the same thing by 2019. And every major car company has publicly announced that they are going fully autonomous. And so by 2029, he says artificial general intelligence will have reached human level intelligence. And so uh, artificial intelligence, it can be narrow, uh, which is like one specific domain that it can do. For example, it can only do chess or it can only you know, be a washing machine. But general intelligence, it can do multiple things. It can play chess and it can drive a car and it can wash the dishes and do multiple things. And so he says that we will reach human level intelligence by 2029. And Sophia, the, uh, a robot made by Hanson Robotics, just got citizenship uh, last year in Saudi Arabia. And uh, you may have checked out Bina48 already. Uh, he also says by 2030s, we will be uploading consciousness. That will become possible and people s will spend more time in virtual worlds than the real world. Now, uh, one comment about robots like Sophia and Bina48. Uh, I don't think their creators believe them to be conscious. Yeah. Uh, they are just much more highly plausible in interacting with humans than prior robots have been. Yeah. Uh, so they're more versatile. They're capable of intelligent dialogue and commentary, uh, but they're still programmed. So I the think I heard him say that like half of it's pr uh, pr uh, input output programming, but the other half it's uh, deep learning, and so uh, you know, she's coming out with her novel, um, right? No novel answers, little questions and stuff. Right. So uh, it's a kind of adaptive system that learns from the information around it, yeah. uh, but it doesn't yet have self-awareness. It doesn't yet have this uh, vantage point upon the world that we have. Uh, so it doesn't have this faculty of I-ness, as I like to refer it, this subjective awareness of the world. Uh, so I would say it is premature to call robots conscious at this stage. Yeah. Uh, a future more advanced intelligence uh, with a brain that is analogous to the human brain, though it might not have the exact same physical structures, could be conscious though. Yeah, it's just important because it's only 2018 mm -hmm. and, and we still have 11 years until his prediction. Right. And so by 2045, but, and so what's important about artificial general intelligence is when that's achieved, artificial super intelligence will be achieved soon thereafter very quickly. And so super intelligence is something that's much more intelligent than humans in every aspect. and. And that's why you, you hear scientists saying that they're creating a godlike creature and all our jobs will be taken and, and whatnot. And so by 2045, the pace of change will be so astonishingly quick that we won't be able to keep up unless we enhance our own intelligence by merging with the intelligence machines we are creating, uh, otherwise known as the singularity. And so here's some of his uh, books that are really important to read. So let's check out some contemporary examples of artificial intelligence. Uh, here's IBM Watson in 2011, uh, downloaded 200 million pages from places like Wikipedia and was not connected to the internet and beat the two greatest uh, Jeopardy players by a landslide, as you can see in the picture. And here's AlphaGo, uh, and uh, AI beat the best player in 2016 uh, five times. And so the game Go, I don't completely understand it, but supposedly there's more moves than there are atoms in the universe. and so. It's, it's a much more important triumph than AI beating chess. And uh, it, it gives you an understanding that they're developing intuition and creativity because there's so many moves um, that to, to beat the, the greatest player, it requires um, great intuition and creativity, because that's what the experts say. And so 
these, these machines are already becoming super intelligent and they're being applied in much more practical areas like medicine and self-driving cars and whatnot. So here's, here's the picture of a GM's car with no steering wheel. Here's a, a link to Sophia walking and, and talking to audience members. Another link of a robot cooking um, different foods. Here's an AI doing a flip. There's, there's a link. And AI are already diagnosing certain diseases better than like whole panels of expert doctors, such as uh, diseases like melanoma and, and different cancers. It's only 2018, like you can imagine what's going to occur in the next 10 years. So uh, I got this graph from Dr. Kaifu Lee. So we've seen similar hype about artificial intelligence plenty of times in the past. And so why should we believe the hype now? Um, like in the 50s, people were making claims that artificial intelligence is going to surpass human intelligence. And then 10 years later, a similar thing happened. And you know, these things just never happened. And so funding stopped and it was terrible. Why the hype is real now is because of a few different reasons. Because of deep learning uh, being developed, uh, also because of the massive amount of data we have. Another reason is because of trillions of dollars is being poured into this. And there's already practical areas that AI can be applied. And also, I would say because of the law of accelerating returns. And so for a quick explanation of what deep learning is, Deep learning essentially is uh, a simplified explanation is that you provide it massive amounts of data and the machine learns, kind of like a human, and it becomes up with its own novel answers. So the, the machines are learning and you know this can be applied just by anything, stock markets or chess moves, video games, diagnosing diseases, and what happens is the machines become super intelligent, they become vastly better than humans and continue to become better. So AI will be ubiquitous, and it's similar to like electricity, how electricity is everywhere. Well, experts are saying that AI will be everywhere. It will be an infrastructure to our society. And so here's a billionaire who's uh, working not only on artificial intelligence, but he's working on extending our lifespan through artificial intelligence and merging your brain with uh, technology. So Dmitry Yitzkov founded the 2045 initiative and this is a different path toward super longevity than the biological life extension path in the sense that he is seeking to create avatars of human beings, essentially robots that can eventually be integrated into a human's brain and essentially become the recipients of human consciousness and personality. To me, there are some philosophical questions about whether or not that vision would preserve a person's I-ness. And I think that would depend also on the pathways that the implementation would take. If there could be some sort of gradual integration or transfer which doesn't disrupt or destroy anything about an existing human's brain or consciousness, yeah. then there's a possibility that this might work. But essentially, there are four stages that are contemplated. The first stage of Avatar is supposed to occur by the end of this decade. We're not certain how far along the 2045 initiative is in actually achieving this. But nonetheless, by 2045, which is also Ray Kurzweil's date for the singularity, uh, they want to have a kind of hologram-like avatar where a person can become projected to any place in the world. Yeah, like a virtual world, kind of, and have like hologram. And so here's uh, Google, uh, also... Uh, as of August 2017, has uh, invested $645 billion into developing AI. Here's Jeff Bezos, you know, the considered one of the wealthiest people on the planet right now, $105 billion. Uh, he is uh, investing large amounts of money into reversing aging and developing artificial intelligence, as you can see, you know, just hundreds of millions of dollars. And he's also working on Blue Origin, which is uh, space technology. Mark Zuckerberg, as of 2017, invested Four hundred and ninety-seven billion dollars in artificial intelligence. Vinod Kosla, 
another billionaire. He uh, he's investing in artificial intelligence. Says uh, no need for medical doctors in 15 years because artificial intelligence will annihilate that job supposedly, which uh, more and more scientists are being convinced of. As of 2017 or or in 2017, uh, this this is how much funding that these these major tech companies have provided into developing artificial intelligence. Masayoshi Son is a Japanese entrepreneur with the SoftBank Group, and he has created a $100 billion fund, the Vision Fund, for financing emerging technologies. He is explicitly convinced that there will be a technological singularity, yeah. and he essentially wants to create the infrastructure for it. Yeah, here's a link of him um, saying uh, explicitly that the singularity will occur. And Saudi Arabia just announced uh, in 2017 planning to build a, a mega city, a, a sort of a smart city in uh, Saudi Arabia, which will span into Jordan and Egypt, actually. It'll be this massive city, which will cost $500 billion, but they plan to spend $2 trillion, And I've actually heard them say that they want to uh, spend trillions more on this city. Where there will be, it'll be fully automated, uh, more robots than humans. It'll be completely r run off of renewable energy. Tran transportation will be completely autonomous, and so much more. Mm -hmm. And I would note this is a massive paradigm shift for Saudi Arabia and the brainchild of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is a lot more progressively minded than the prior ruling elite of Saudi Arabia. He is very much an advocate of technological development as well as some cultural and societal liberalization. Of course, it will be an enormous challenge for Saudi Arabia, uh, given its current repressive political climate, to transition to this. But maybe if he can build a city that is off on its own and has its own laws, its own climate, which allows people a lot of the freedoms that are currently denied in Saudi Arabia, then a lot of Saudis will see the clear difference as well. Yeah. And they will see this neom as an example of what reforms should be occurring within the larger area of Saudi Arabia. So perhaps this is a catalyst for broader liberalization, starting with Saudi Arabia and then extending to the Middle East. The fact that Saudi Arabia uh, was able to recognize a robot as a citizen, even though it's partly a public relations move, I think, connected with this, yeah. is indicative of a gradual opening of their perspectives and an increased tolerance and inclusivity, which we hope will continue. Yeah, and South Korea is doing uh, something very similar, making a, s a smart city uh, uh, using $35 billion so far. Bill Gates is doing something similar in Arizona uh, using $80 million. So here's Brian Johnson, has invested uh, $100 million so far in the kernel, in where he's developing brain-computer interface, so which is uh, connecting your brain to the computer. Remember Ray Kurzweil saying that occurring uh, in the years of 2030, around like 2035, and so they're already developing it. And so here's some uh, awesome links to sh to show how how far brain computer interface already is. Here's a monkey driving uh, around a wheelchair that's connected to a computer that is connected to his brain, and he's just with his thoughts he's moving the wheelchair. They've implanted memories from one mouse into another one. You know, one mouse would understand this uh, maze very well, another one didn't understand it at all. And then they implant the memories, and now it, that new mouse understands the maze uh, very well also. And here are people moving robot arms with a brain-computer interface. Uh, this is awesome. A monkey with a broken spinal cord, they, they had this device where uh, it, through Wi-Fi, they, they had devices on both of the spinal cords and through Wi-Fi they can connect to each other and the monkey started like walking again, which is, which is incredible. And here's uh, drone races, um, they've been happening actually for a while, um, where you put on a brain computer interface, um, it's, it doesn't have to be like surgically connected, but you can fly a drone.
So you can think of, you know, you can extrapolate. So this is where, brain computer interface is where you, you start hearing scientists be like, we're about to become god-like creatures and just completely augment ourselves into a popular um, name is Homo Deus. Uh, Deus is Latin for God. And, and so you can imagine the difference of intelligence between like an ant and like Isaac Newton. For simplicity, just, just imagine the difference of intelligence. Well, it's about to go in the, the, the next, go from human to like we will be the ants relative to this machine, right? And so, you know, I kind of imagine like understanding like all of biochemistry and like mathematics and, and physics, etc. the same way we understand like one plus one equals two right now. Mm -hmm. and, and so it really is just, you know, it would be an incredible thing. So imagine being able to upload information into your mind the way you can upload information into a computer. Yeah. That would be uh, the analog and to have this processing capability uh, in order to be able, uh, for instance, to solve millions of uh, simultaneous uh, mathematical equations in your mind just by thinking about it. So this brain-computer interface is intriguing to me because it can eliminate a lot of the bottlenecks to technological advancement and to societal improvement that exists today. These bottlenecks uh, arise from limited human cognitive capabilities. We already have a lot more information out there than our unaided minds can process. So the question is, what is the next step? How do we lift that constraint? And the yeah. brain-computer interface, by improving the human mind, may be the answer to that. Yeah. And so here's Elon Musk. Uh, he is the epitome of what a human being should be, uh, I think. <laughs> he, he's pretty much saving the planet um, in a lot of ways. He revolutionized the car industry with uh, Tesla. And cars are not only going autonomous, but they're also going electric, and largely due to his company. And uh, you can see uh, on this map with all the red dots on it, this is the electric grid that he's created for cars to be charged. And so, it's large infrastructure. Here is his uh, Gigafactory, where it's uh, essentially a massive battery where he can store energy. And he says that he only needs 100 of them for, to give renewable energy to the entire planet. And there's actually better batteries coming out um, already. And so, th this is very uh, optimistic. So, the Gigafactory was actually constructed here in northern Nevada at the uh, Tahoe Reno Industrial Center and this is essentially the facility with the largest square footage currently in the world. It is going to be used to manufacture batteries for electric vehicles, not just Tesla vehicles but other vehicles as well. Uh, it is currently operational, but as I understand it, not fully operational. They're going to uh, be expanding their production capabilities there. But this is one of the crucial facilities for enabling mass adoption of electric vehicles. Once they get it to be fully operational, then perhaps they will have the wherewithal to mass produce the Model 3, which is intended to be the first consumer available electric vehicle with the kind of reliability and precision engineering and high-end systems that Tesla is famous for. Yeah, and, and uh, I don't know if you've been keeping up with like solar energy and wind energy, uh, but renewable renewables are exponentially decreasing in cost. And, and Ramiz Nam, he extrapolates the trend, and if the trend keeps happening, then by the year 2025, we should be able to buy a Tesla model Three for like ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars, and but but they're about to become autonomous too, and so then you start hearing experts talk about how the price is just going to decrease by so much more, and so definitely check that out. Uh, Elon Musk also founded SpaceX. They're planning to go to Mars in two thousand twenty-four and possibly even sooner, uh, where NASA is planning uh, by two thousand thirty you definitely need to start keeping up with SpaceX if you haven't already because they are doing incredible things uh, with space technology.
Elon Musk also uh, founded OpenAI, where they are developing artificial intelligence, but not just uh, developing the, the power of AI, but really focusing on trying to make sure that it doesn't like destroy us in any way, that it's not harmful, um, and that it's uh, as optimal as possible. So Elon Musk is very concerned about existential risk arising from artificial general intelligence, and there are different perspectives on that. I tend to be uh, of the mindset that AI itself is not so much the existential risk as the irrational behavior of humans today, including what some humans might do in response to the emergence of AI. But nonetheless, it is worthwhile to consider, for instance, uh, what makes for ethical behavior in a sentient entity. What capacities do humans have to enable them to think about morality, to respect the rights of others, and how can those capabilities and certain moral constraints be engineered into an artificially intelligent system? Yeah. So I tend to be skeptical of any sort of hype about AI destroying the world or destroying humanity, but thinking about how can technology be applied ethically, and if we create another mind, another sentient being, how can that entity be structured to at least have a strong incentive to behave ethically yeah. uh, would be a worthwhile endeavor. Yeah, and so uh, one of the problems with uh, people find with AI is that uh, first is there's about to be massive job loss, right? Um, like self-driving cars, in about like 20 years, it'll probably be very rare to see somebody driving a car themselves. It'll, we will have complete uh, self-driving cars. Right? And so all those people whose occupation is driving a car, like a truck driver or a taxi driver, which is one of the most uh, top occupations right now, are going to be wiped out. But that's, that's, that's not just it. Uh, automation is about to just like flood so many different jobs. And so uh, there's about to be massive disruption, and of course that could cause societal uh, upheaval. Right. So how, how do we handle that politically? One proposal has been a universal unconditional basic income to enable people essentially to weather any economic fluctuations if they happen to lose their jobs they still have a floor financially below which they cannot fall likewise the markets themselves could evolve as new technologies emerge yes some jobs will be rendered obsolete due to automation as they have been historically yeah. But new types of jobs may be created. Those jobs are going to rely more on cognitive skills yeah. and the use of intelligent judgment, given that especially the first iterations of AIs are not going to replace humans so much as work collaboratively with humans, uh, humans using narrow AI systems yeah. to fulfill specific goals. But the humans have to be conversant with those systems. They have to understand how those systems work and what their strengths are as well as their limitations. And furthermore, I would say in more sophisticated professional positions where a lot of judgment is still involved or in positions that involve decision making or management, there will still very much be a need for humans to be involved. The question is, are we going to have enough humans with the skill sets necessary to undertake those roles in an increasingly complex world? This is where education and the use of technology to improve educational opportunity would be crucial. Yeah, uh, but then the second thing is artificial superintelligence, which the, the, the thing will make us look like a house cat or like an ant relative to its intelligence. And so how do we keep up with that? Uh, one way of doing that is through a brain-computer interface uh, that Elon Musk endorses and has a company where he is investing um, large amounts of money into. So to keep up their intelligence, we connect our brains to them so that we could be intelligent with them. And here's Eric Drexler. Here's another paradigm shift uh, sort of technology, which is nanotechnology. And it's actually already becoming a reality with uh, examples like tissue nanotransfection. And so imagine a bunch of 
robots that are on the nanoscale, 10 to the minus 9 meters. So they will be, be able to manipulate our health on you know, a molecular scale. Mm -hmm. And this should be occurring relatively soon, within the next 30 years. And this could actually be the means by which some of the rejuvenation therapies are delivered. The SENS approach focuses on damage at the cellular level. How does one have sufficiently refined tools to fix that damage? Perhaps those tools will be available in the form of nanobots that can go into the bloodstream and then target individual cells and, uh, for instance, uh, break the uh, protein crosslinks between the cells or yeah. even repair uh, some of the damage at the molecular level. Yeah. And so here's a quantum computer. Um, this is actually becoming a reality uh, lately. So uh, Intel just came out with a 49 qubit uh, quantum chip. Supposedly that means it is becoming a reality and we should have it very soon. To give you an understanding of where our species may go is the Kardashev scale. So the Kardashev scale discusses the energy capabilities of a civilization, how much energy it harnesses, and essentially a type 1 civilization is one that controls the resources of an entire planet, and by comparison, Carl Sagan, when he was alive, stated that uh, our current civilization on Earth is about 8.7 on that scale, so we're not yet at type 1, but we may be in this century. Yeah. A type 2 civilization harnesses uh, all of the energy of a star and some project that human civilization might get there in a few thousand years. A type 3 civilization harnesses all of the resources of the galaxy so if humans control the entire Milky Way could readily traverse it and utilize uh, all of the energy sources present in our whole galaxy that would be a type 3 civilization and the projections for that vary from a few hundred thousand to a million years, but of course these time frames from our present vantage point are rather speculative given the difficulty of anticipating future technological advancements. One matter that is important to consider is the transition to a type 1 civilization has some pitfalls involved along the way. Yeah. And we're seeing uh, already that we are living through a very tumultuous era. So can we have the wisdom and foresight to ensure that that transition occurs as smoothly as possible? Or through the age-old follies of humankind, will we be wiped out or set back to a dark age before that transition could happen. Yeah. And so, similar to the space race, there has been an AI race going on lately. Uh, it began in the private sector, uh, mainly, uh, but recently, whole governments have been um, subsidizing companies to make this artificial general intelligence and artificial super intelligence because they're starting to understand that whoever wins this race could possibly be the leader of the world. And so China publicly announced by 2020, we will have caught up to the U.S. AI industry. By 2025, we will be ahead of the U.S. And by 2030, we will dominate the industry of AI. And so I don't know how to take that. Um, and the U.S. didn't have a response, the U.S. government. But the only reason why we're ahead is because of our private sector. Uh, DARPA works on AI um, a little bit, but uh, I, I don't hear too much going on with our U.S. government and artificial intelligence. I think... There's certainly interest in the subject uh, at the U.S. government level. Now, from my standpoint and the standpoint of the U.S. Transhumanist Party, uh, we are an international movement. So our objective is not so much to further the interest of any one particular country as it is to have the technology available for the benefit of human beings. So if Chinese researchers are the first ones to make major breakthroughs toward artificial general intelligence, I would say that is fine as long as that technology then becomes available to the rest of the world, as long as it's not hoarded by the Chinese government, for yeah. instance, or used for purposes of domination. But 
if the scientific community remains a global and interconnected community, uh, the successor of what would have been called the Republic of Letters in the 17th and 18th centuries, then the technologies could spread no matter uh, what country the initial discovery was made in. So I would say the best option for U.S. researchers and U.S. institutions is to seek collaboration as much as possible with yeah. these research efforts in other countries. Yeah, and so here are the four companies that uh, the Chinese government is uh, giving large subsidies to. Russia is is racing to create uh, AI. Uh, South Korea, there's like over 400 AI uh, companies in all over Europe. Uh, Canada is a major leader in AI research. And of course the US. And of course uh, we already sort of elaborated on the US. It's mainly the private sector such as Google and Microsoft and Amazon and Facebook that are just pouring money uh, and is the reason why the US is ahead of everyone right now. Mm -hmm. But that may change very soon. So with regard to how we manage the transition to the next era of our civilization, the U.S. Transhumanist Party offers a vision that is distinctive in the political realm. This is the title slide of a presentation I delivered in March of 2017 with regard to pursuing a future of extreme progress. You can find out a lot more on our website, which is www.transhumanist-party.org. We encourage anybody who is interested in the technological future to become a member of the U.S. Transhumanist Party, which you can become for free by going on our website. Membership will remain completely free it will entitle you to vote in our internal elections, to participate in our policy deliberations, and to devise solutions regarding what policies, what changes to our society would be conducive to the growth of all of these technological fields in a manner that benefits as many people as possible. And we are uh, truly committed to inclusivity. We are the only political party in the United States that accepts non-U.S. residents uh, as well as people who are not eligible to vote in the United States as allied members, which essentially means they can participate in our internal discussions as our U.S. members can. Uh, of course, they wouldn't be able to vote in actual U.S. elections for office holders, but in terms of our policy votes, or even our nomination process for candidates, allied members are welcome to take part. We, in addition to thinking about policies and thinking about how to influence the U.S. political arena, also seek to be a hub for information. So if someone goes on to our website, they will find articles about emerging advances in biotechnology. Uh, they will find opportunities for projects that they could undertake. For instance, helping out with crowdfunding a, a research endeavor or uh, participating in a distributed computing project. So what we seek to be is a central point within this community uh, that is pursuing emerging technologies for advocacy, for connecting people, for enabling people to discover what projects are out there where they could contribute their time and energy to whatever extent they're capable of. One of my hopes is to have our website be a portal where somebody who just wants to spend 15 minutes helping out a transhumanist or life extension oriented or pro-technology cause would have the wherewithal to do that. We hold a lot of discussion panels, we hold Q&A sessions, we network with other groups, research institutions, activist organizations, and we try to find 
common areas where we can collaborate, where we can advance a particular technology or we can advance a reform for more accountability at various levels of government for the use of technology to bring about greater transparency. We have a detailed constitution that contains 83 platform planks so far that were proposed by our members and voted on using an innovative ranked preference voting method where essentially instead of just voting for one option one can rank order one's options in the order of favorability in one's view so you assign number one to your most favored choice, you assign number two to your second highest preference, you assign number three to your third highest preference. And then if your most favored choice gets eliminated, uh, you continue to have influence in subsequent rounds of the instant runoff process. So your number two choice becomes the number one uh, for your vote in the next round. And this occurs iteratively until one option gets the majority of votes. So we are trying to reform the political system, not just from the standpoint of what policies we want to see adopted, but with regard to our very operations, how inclusive we are, the processes that we use for voting. We try to be a model for transparency to prevent the kinds of manipulations of the system and the kinds of toxic power dynamics that have consumed the major political parties in the United States. Yeah, and uh, how many uh, transhumanist parties uh, in, like, in states and countries have emerged? Like, what's like a rough estimate, do you think? Well, we, we have various state-level transhumanist parties as well. For instance, in Nevada, in California, in Texas, in Kentucky, in New Hampshire. These are the most prominent examples. So I would say about five or six active state-level transhumanist parties. There's also a transhumanist party in the United Kingdom, which is quite active. There's a transhumanist party in Australia. There's an incipient transhumanist party in Germany. And there are groups of transhumanist activists throughout the world. The U.S. transhumanist party seeks to collaborate with them. One way in which we do that is through our foreign ambassador program where we actually have individuals who reside in other countries who seek to essentially develop the transhumanist communities over there. And that could be connecting with the transhumanist party of that jurisdiction. It could be in the form of setting up meetings, uh, writing reports about the state of transhumanist thought in that country, uh, as well as engaging in outreach and persuasion efforts to communicate to residents of other countries essentially what you and I communicated today, Bobby, as well as making it relevant to their setting, to their needs, showing them how technology could improve their lives. So our foreign ambassador program is quite successful. At this point, we have about 10 foreign ambassadors and we continue to accept new applications online. Awesome. And so people feel such great feelings towards transhumanism and the singularity that they uh, feel religious about it. And you've actually seen religions be created such as Mormon Transhumanist Association or the Christian Transhumanist Association. And uh, Bill Falloon, particularly in Florida, he uh, has a church of perpetual life where it's a really awesome church. They provide different uh, therapies to extend uh, longevity research. They provide information about it um, that either isn't FDA approved yet or is already approved. And so definitely check him out because he has a lot of valuable information. And here's uh, two really good books that are uh, really popular um, that thoroughly explain the potential threats and what good can come from AI. So Hugo de Garris wrote a book about the Artelect War and he's kind of a pessimist as to humankind's future but his scenario is that there will be two factions in the future 
One would be the cosmists who side with emerging technologies as well as uh, who would be supportive of the development of artificial superintelligence. The other faction would be the reactionary faction, the Terrans who want to keep humankind exactly as it is. But what is interesting about Hugo de Garris's scenario is that it does not say the AI will be developed and it will destroy us all. It says the AI will be developed and the Terrans will react against it with hostility and violence, and that is what will trigger this Ardalek war, uh, which he fears would be tremendously damaging. So one of the main goals of the Transhumanist Party is to avoid the Ardalek war, to make sure that our society does not get to the point of that conflagration. So I see this book as cautionary. Uh, in order to avoid that, we need to be having these discussions about the future potential of AI, the ethical implications, and how we can smoothly integrate artificial intelligence into our society. What policies might need to be undertaken today in order to prevent this bifurcation of human perspectives on AI. So instead of us splitting into Terrans and Cosmists in the future, let's hope that AI in the future can become what electricity or automobiles or open heart surgery are today. And those technologies are widely accepted by most individuals irrespective of their political affiliations. Yep. There are ethical considerations concerning these emerging technologies and how we can get the majority of people to benefit from them. So right now a lot of the therapies for life extension or experimental gene therapies or any sort of cutting edge medical treatments are expensive. And they're expensive because in part they're new and a lot of research goes into them, a lot of resources go into them, and the creators of these therapies need to recoup their costs. But another source of the expense is the current regulatory climate, where it takes so much time, it takes so much money to get a treatment approved, especially by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. There is the question of what can be done to accelerate the mass deployment of these therapies, how can costs be brought down, how can supply be increased, and that is something we continue to think about. Yeah, and so you can see this massive convergence uh, of all these technologies, these uh, 11 we've really talked about just a little bit, and there's so many more that we haven't talked about, like tissue regeneration, and etc. that's going on in science. In the next like 10 years, you should, we should be seeing some serious impact with these areas, with the product being massive amount of diseases cured. But within the next 30 years uh, is, is, is really where you'll see just such promising results. One slogan that we supporters of longevity like to use is live forever or die trying. Yeah. De facto, this is what will happen but it is also a, a worthwhile goal. That is to say, we have everything at stake in this endeavor. We are seeking to prevent our own annihilation, but also to help every member of the human species, as many of them as possible, to prevent their annihilation. So this is at the same time a self-interested endeavor, but also an endeavor for the benefit of all. And this is a great quest and a great challenge that all of us as humans can unite in. So instead of fighting wars, instead of engaging in petty conflicts, instead of continuing to dwell in this mindset of scarcity, let us work together toward a future where we have abundant and limitless possibilities, not just in terms of the material objects that we own 
or the activities we can undertake, but also the time that we have to enjoy our lives and to develop ourselves. That is what longevity and life extension are ultimately about. All right, thanks for listening. Thank you very much.